So thanks so much for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to talk about the importance of transformation in government and particularly the role of technology and people in driving major change in government. I think I, it's really important to start for me with why the topic of transformation matters. Because every day in my job, I deal with human beings who don't like transformation. You know, it, the word itself sounds really good, but when it means to a human being, everything I know and have done before is changing, and I don't know what the future is going to look like. As a human being, that inherently does something to the very back of your brain in the amygdala, and it sets off a fight or flight response. And yet, it's 20 years into the 21st century, and so much is changing in our broader world. The environment in which we live and operate every day, even today, I'm sure, uh, is always on. It's very customer-centric, and it's incredibly agile and changing all the time. Um, I don't see any Starbucks cups, but I'm sure there's some out there. Uh, when I come in to work in the morning, if I want a coffee, oh wait, there's one, is that one right there? No. Um, I use my mobile device. It accesses a cloud and enables me to identify the drink that I always get at Starbucks and transmit that to the local Starbucks that's closest to me. My coffee then is ready when I walk into the Starbucks. It's seamless. It's always available whenever the Starbucks is, is there. And I see a human barista who actually knows my name. Now, does she really know my name? It's written on the cup, right? But, but she knows when I come in, and it's a human experience. It's enabled by technology. It's enabled by the cloud. But it's also connected to the local point of sale. Starbucks was a former client of mine. And I happen to know, in order to get the sales tax calculation right and be sure that they actually have the order that I want, it has to be connected locally. It has to be utterly relevant to the human experience I'm going to have. Because if it's not decaf, everybody will know. <laughs> I get interventions occasionally. Um, Uber. Anyone take Uber here today? So Uber transformed an experience that 10 years ago would have been like, where do I park? Or let me call a cab. Does the cab arrive? I'm not sure. I'm going to be late. Uber basically figured out the experience I want isn't calling a cab. The experience I want is being sure I can get where I'm going on time. That's the experience. So I can see the car that's coming. I can have a, a level of confidence that that car is going to bring me where I need it to go. And I don't have to fumble with my wallet when I get out of the car. That's a totally different experience. And it's one that, again, it links into the cloud, but it connects humans. It connects drivers. And actually, one of the really important things about Uber is it creates a connection to a whole new workforce, gig economy kind of workforce. And it created a payment capability that says if somebody wants to get paid today, you know, they need that new pair of sneakers they just saw, they can jump in the workforce today, drive around a little bit, and then have money to go into a mall and buy those sneakers that they want. So it's crossing the digital and physical divide. Now, why does that matter to government? Well, I'd argue that you know, there's a certain amount of importance to getting me a nice cup of coffee and not getting me caffeine when I, when I don't need caffeine or getting me place to place. But the challenges we have in government are far more important than when I get the, my desired cup of coffee or whether I get here to there exactly on time, although my assistant thinks me getting on time is more important than just about anything. Um, she fails at, at making me do that. But 
we're dealing with fires and floods and cyber threats that are always present. And increasingly, they are affecting every part of our life as it becomes more tech enabled. And we need to respond that way. We also need to be able to respond to the service levels that people expect. In, in the agency I'm working at right now, OPM, uh, one of the big things we do is administer the retirement trust fund. Anybody drawing on the retirement trust fund for federal workers? Anyone want to? OK. So if anybody knows anything about our system, it is entirely old operates on Z12 mainframe computers, database. Anybody know what that is? OK, I didn't either. Um, I think like four of those database systems were sold. Ours may be the only one still in existence. I don't know. But so many changes that have needed to happen to that system over time have been kind of wired together in a very inefficient way. And we don't have a case management system that supports how we service that. We don't have robotic process automation that eliminates errors in some of the translations between systems. So we have quantitative errors. And we are not able to give the world-class customer experience that our retirees deserve. And we have far too many errors. We have far too long a wait time for people to get paid. That's utterly unacceptable. Even worse, on the cyber front, we have all kinds of challenges in terms of delivering what the American people need. So transformation is fundamental in government. And we know that we're lagging the private sector. We know that we're not providing the experiences we should. Now, we've made a lot of progress. So last year, I think I probably talked about the president's management agenda and the things that I thought were really blocking our ability to get traction on change in this space. And there were three main areas that we we all, I think, know. IT modernization is clearly important to that. And you all know that long before folks like me you know, got up here and, and said something about that. But I think one of the things that's a little bit different this time is we linked in the whole notion of IT modernization to a whole lot of other enabling capabilities, things like financing. So the Technology Modernization Fund was a working capital type fund um, that was approved through the MGT Act, along with the ability for agencies to use working capital funds to invest in technology. And I'm thrilled to say that we funded 90 million in investments in the last year uh, across seven agencies, or no, seven projects and five agencies. And these are going to have transformational impact on upgrading mainframes that have not been looked at and have been major cyber breaches. Um, they're going to be helping farmers.gov, for example, get into the 21st century and serve customers uh, and farmers and producers the way they need to be served. You all know about US Digital Service providing all kinds of, of great IT support for groups like the Small Business Administration, the Veterans Administration, to focus on the customer service aspects of modernizing government. And then we have centers of excellence that are, again, looking at things like call center management, customer experience, and IT transformation uh, at a range of agencies, uh, the first of which was the USDA. HUD was the second one. And I'm proud to say OPM is the third agency. And that retirement set of challenges that I mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to have the GSA centers of excellence helping us work on moving forward into the next generation. We've also just launched yesterday a data strategy that's providing a perspective going forward on how we want to think about data much more strategically as an asset, as something that we can leverage to not only serve the American people better, but potentially to help grow the economy by commercializing data. You know, some folks have heard my Pokemon Go example. GPS is, is wired into about half the apps on everybody's phones. Those are capabilities that came from the federal government. You know, GPS data, monuments data, NOAA weather data, 
all are government sourced and have driven billions of dollars of value creation in the private sector. We need to do more of that. That will help create the jobs of the 21st century. Last but not least, and this is the place where I think we have the most work yet to do, is on the people front of the agenda. So many of our technology projects get stuck on people. We don't have the right skills. We have too many people with a certain set of skills and not enough people with other sets of skills. Moving people and getting those people aligned with what we need today, which might be something we need for only two or three years, and then we need something else. We don't have the agility to do the reskilling at a rapid basis. So we've worked on a couple of things. We've instituted some direct hire authorities for STEM and cyber and IT jobs. Guidance has gone out on that. I think the agencies are actually starting to reap the benefits of that. We've also done a number of things on the reskilling front. Um, NSF has done the Career Compass Challenge to help us look at feds and how do we um, actually reskill and bring the private sector and, and leading practice into doing that. Um, we've done the Cyber uh, Reskilling Academy. Uh, you know, we, we were doing a pilot program. We had, you know, 25 slots available. We thought, you know, we're going to get a couple hundred applicants. We got 1,500 applicants. And what was most amazing to me is that they weren't all GS 14, 15 type people. We had, I'd say about 500 of the total uh, population were in grades 5 to 9 of the GS, bargaining unit eligible employees. And that is utterly critical because one of the biggest challenges we have and the broader workforce has is reskilling folks who were essentially skilled for a manual or a paper-based world into having the skills for the 21st century. And so we're really excited about that. In closing, though, there is so much more to do. Um, we've also made progress on a lot of enabling capabilities in grants and uh, improper payments, category management. But the, the two areas I want to spend a lot more time on in the coming year um, are going to be enabled by something we announced, um, I don't know, a couple months ago. Uh, called the Gear Center um, Challenge. And we had a challenge, and we received, I think, something like 49 responses from a compilation of academia, private sector, uh, good government groups, and uh, folks who are knowledgeable uh, in the community. Probably many of the companies in, in, in this population here uh, participated. But we're really focused on a number of key questions that we think the private sector need to help us answer. The question about reskilling is first and foremost on my mind. Data commercialization is another one. But I also think there's huge opportunity to look at acquisition innovation. How do we use AI to do a better job with acquisition, be more flexible, be more able to take in technology from the private sector? How do we think about financing differently? So I mentioned the Technology Modernization Fund and the Working Capital Funds that were part of it, um, Modernizing um, uh, Government Technology Act. Funding for IT transformation is one of the toughest challenges I've personally faced in government. Because capital allocation in the world I come from, the private sector, happens from the executive. You know, the CEO. And the whole structure of a corporation is designed to get capital to the projects that help drive the most value. In government, IT and infrastructure are not viewed as programs. So programs are how the whole funding model of government work. And IT is sort of a also ran thing. And we're only really good at funding it when it blows up. And I have great confidence that Congress will give us money when things blow up. But that isn't a good experience, because that puts us at risk of cyber failures. I think um, OPM is a great example of that. But there are other major issues. Like my biggest concern at OPM is something happens that causes 
one of my systems to break, and retirees, vulnerable people who depend on money coming from our system, not being available when they need it. That is the most fundamental thing about transforming government through IT and people, is the reason this matters the most is what we do affects all Americans. And I think in closing, you know, the lapse that we had earlier this year, which was really unfortunate um, for everyone, but I think the American people saw more than anything the things they don't think about that this government does really matter and transforming them so that they can be always on, always available is probably the most powerful mission I will ever get a chance to serve. So I thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>